Good evening, everyone. And I as well would like to acknowledge the unceded ancestral homeland of the uh, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Um, I've had many teachings and blessings from from this community, and I'm very grateful to uh, to know the spirit of the mountain. Um, so good evening. It's nice to see everyone. We're out here. I don't know exactly what I've gotten myself into, but I'm happy to be here. As uh, has been mentioned, today's event is uh, tonight's event is an Oxford style of debating, where each group will present to the audience their argument for either being pro or con for dismantling colonial markers. I think that we are in a very special moment in Vancouver, Canada, as well as other parts of the world. Perhaps even a rebirth could happen and a new could begin. With reconciliation, which is meant to reveal, repair, and heal the wound, the wounds of colonialism and uh, state oppression against Indigenous people, 2SLGBTQ+, which is an acronym um, that stands for Two-Spirit, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, or Questioning, and any additional sexual orientations and gender identities in some, all those who have been legally oppressed by state law. Through these legislative policies of oppression, some of the characters that conceived and implemented such oppressive policies are on display with monuments and markers because they were considered worthy of a type of public adoration. Colonial markers are also reminders and signifiers of racist, sexist public policy, and they are tied to a certain type of knowledge production that in some cases celebrates wrongdoing. When a society monumentalizes people who have been unkind, people who have been violent, and have perpetuated an abuse of power, what then do these markers represent now? These markers were initially made to honor people, generally leaders of our society, our collective society, primarily men in positions of power, and a few queens, I'm sure, of different sexual orientations. And now, some of these public figures are deemed unworthy of being monumentalized because their actions were unjust, both then and now. But back then, their unjust behavior was considered status quo and acceptable, hence Gassy Jack, the pedophile, who was four years old when he married Gohelia, a 12-year-old Squamish girl. And as we have recently witnessed and learned this week from the removal of his colonial marker, Descendants of Kohalia were working with the city to determine how to remove this marker and are displeased of how this is all unfolded. The question of process of who decides removal of colonial markers within Indigenous territories must also be part of the discussion. Part of the concern now is accountability. How can, do, should societies hold past actions of public policy and public figures responsible for what they have done within today's standards, however fraught those standards might be. It's important to note that I'm framing public policy, state law, as being completely implicated in the very foundation of colonial markers. Sorry, the lighting's a bit funny, I should move my paper. So, how do we begin anew? with this violent colonial legacy that haunts our current relations because we're in relations with each other. We're always going to be in relations. So how do we make those relations the best they can possibly be? And what role do these colonial markers have in our current society? Can they enhance our knowledge about what went wrong in history and what needs to be changed and what shouldn't happen ever again? Can colonial markers teach us? Can, can, and, and what might those teachings be? Or do they visually suggest that those who were perpetrators of violence and exploitation of days gone by deserve to remain in the public sphere, sphere however offensive they are, 
and then you know how does it influence a pu public discourse about colonial markers. This style of debate tonight is a safe zone for people to express ideas that are pro and con. I want to thank the debaters and the organizers in advance for being brave and to participate. As sometimes they are, they are not even presenting what they believe in, but rather they are presenting an argument or a position for the sake of the debate. So let's all have open hearts and clear minds for the topic at hand. Um, also, in the great words of Gloria and Azula, uh, the, the, the noted Shikana cultural theorist, her quote, I quote, rigidity is death. And every time I think of her, I always return to that quote, rigidity is death. So how do we allow for differing positionalities to flourish and to learn from both? So here's how the evening will go. Um, you will vote hearing the you will vote before hearing the debate, and this is really key because it's about your mind being changed, perhaps. So you will vote before hearing the debate. We will quickly tabulate the results and let you know the results. Then the debaters will do their best to try and change your minds of who you disagree of, of pardon me, and change the minds of you who disagree with them. First, each member of our two-person debate teams will give their opening statements for seven minutes each. Then I moderate an exchange period in which the debaters get to pose questions and arguments to each other directly, and members of the audience will do the same. I will also probe the debaters on what they've argued. Then each debater will give a closing statement of two minutes. When the debate is completed, you will be asked again to vote. The team that wins the debate is the one that changed the most minds. So let's get going. And now I invite each of you to cast your vote. How exciting. Okay, the results are in. We have pro 81% and con 19%. Note that down. So let's meet the teams. They are smart, they are knowledgeable, and they're brave. Please welcome tonight's debaters. Uh, Nadine Nakawa is a uh, new Westminster City Council writer, consultant, and co-founder of the Feminist Campaign School. And her teammate is Crystal Parabou. Crystal is a curator and historian who recently joined the city of Vancouver as a public art planner. And uh, she is a member of the Black and Indigenous Design Collective. And now we have uh, Tiania Voyoshivik is an assistant professor with the Arche with it, of architectural history and theory at UBC Salsa, uh, Sala. And originally from Siberia, she studied architect at Yale and MIT. As a new Canadian, uh, she is working hard to understand the colonial past of her new home. Her teammate is Michael. Ko Pao, a historian and curator. He's engaged with material culture and critical theory. Michael is a faculty member of OCAD University in Toronto. Welcome. So, next, each debater will now be given seven minutes to make an opening statement. We will begin with Nadine arguing for the resolution. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. My name is Nadine Nakagawa, and I'm a city councillor in New Westminster, which is the unceded territory of the Hong Kong Yom speaking people. Just a reminder that when we say unceded, we mean stolen. In 2019, I brought a motion to remove the Judge Begbie statue, which stood in front of the law courts. Begbie is best known as a hanging judge, and he hung the Sokotin chiefs. Why did we remove that statue? Quite simply, because the Sokotin nation told us to. I want to make three points tonight. The first is that it matters who gets to decide. When we look at the current system, it was established off of exclusion. 
The structure is colonial. Let's look at this debate. This debate is deeply colonial as well. We're in Robson Square. John Robson, as an MLA, disenfranchised Indigenous and Chinese people. He took away their right to vote. He took away their right to have a say. This is an Oxford style debate. So even the conversation that we're having is based off colonialism. And these are choices that we make. There's other ways to have discussions. I'm just gonna point out the demographics of the participants that are here today. This is indicative of the nature of this debate truly. I wanna give an example about who gets to decide and I'm gonna use a totally different example. My grandmother turns 99 this year. She was interned in the Second World War. The BC government just wrapped up a consultation process asking what would constitute an apology for internment. I have to be honest with you. I don't care what most of you think about what constitutes an apology. I don't care what, what Crystal thinks or the folks on the opposition side think either. What matters is what my grandma and people who are interned and people who are living with the intergenerational trauma thinks. That's who should get to decide what makes an apology appropriate. It's the same here. Some people say that we could challenge these statues, we could do art, we could disrespect them, we could put up a plaque. But again, who gets to decide? Who gets to decide what that plaque would say? That's what matters. You can see some images of ways that art, art has been used to disrespect statues and monuments. But again, it needs to be the people who are impacted, negatively impacted and harmed by their presence. This is a Simon Fraser statue, <clears throat> which is along the boardwalk in the New Westminster Quay. An artist wanted to do, um, wanted to actually cut out that red section of the plinth, but she wasn't able to, so she settled for painting it red. The police were called on her. This was a white artist who had permission to do it. So really when we talk about challenging or disrespecting statues, people aren't okay with that either. That's not a real argument. The next point I wanna make is, do you see yourself represented in your city? When you look around, do you see your culture, your history, and your celebration centered? Do you see yourself in your decision makers, your politicians, your movie stars, your business leaders, and artists? I don't, I never have. Statues are not about learning history. They are about celebrating. They're about placemaking and they're about centering. The example of the Begbie statue, he was at the law courts, which is a, is a place of power. We know that people go there on their worst days, either as victims of crime, witnesses, or people who are charged with a crime. We also know that Indigenous people are overrepresented in all the negative counts in our communities, whether it's poverty, homelessness, overdose crisis, or incarceration. This is all a result of colonialism. This is not about history. We do not learn history from statues. It's about power. It's about owning the narrative and saying whose land we're on. This is the last point I wanna make. This is all about colonialism. This is a current exhibit at the New Westminster Museum and Ar Archives. Um, the very colorful piece is by an artist named Luke Purnell, who's Niska and Haida, and it's called Neon Reconciliation Explosion. With it, is the baby statue lying down on its back, as well as the 215 shoes from the memorial set up after uh, we found the, the children who were murdered in residential schools. We had some, some elementary school kids tour this exhibit. And one of the conversations that came up is who gets to have a name? Why does Begby get a statue, streets named after him, schools, uh, restaurants and, and businesses named after him? And none of those 215 kids get names. These statues aren't even old. They were set up in the 70s and 80s to reinforce the narrative of colonialism. Begbie and the hanging of the chiefs was for removing the Sukhothin nation from their land to build a railway through it. Residential schools were about removing indigenous people from their land too. This is all connected. These markers aren't about learning and reflecting. They're about celebrating a history of genocide that we are just beginning to know. And by we, I mean we as settlers. Indigenous people have always known this history. They have been yelling and crying for us to recognize it. I'm gonna finish with a quote that I, that I heard from my friend Rhiannon, who's Musqueam. 
And she said, who would defend keeping up these celebrations, these celebrations of the perpetrators of genocide? Who would defend that? Who indeed? Thank you. So now, oh, yes. <laughs> She's going to argue against. My argument tonight is not about whether we should preserve colonial markers in order to preserve history and discuss it better. My argument is going to rest on two premises. The first premise is about the value of the act of removing the colonial marker from my position as an ally, of course. And I will argue that uh, the most powerful thing about removing colonial uh, markers is the performative uh, nature of this act. Uh, the second element uh, of my argument is that when markers are permanently removed, we lose the opportunity to repeat the performance of our stance against uh, colonialism. When I talk about performative, I might be a little bit uh, too academic in that I drew my inspiration uh, from J.L. Austin's uh, text, How to Do Things with Words, and this notion of a performative speech act, which is at the same time an action and a statement. Famously, J.L. Austin uh, talked about how their particular kinds of utterances or acts, which he called perlocutory utterances, uh, where what we are talking about, it does not matter what we are denoting or what we are represented, but it um, matters what our words are doing. So some examples of those are battle cries uh, or family prayers before dinner or very significantly wedding vows where a particular statement or a particular uh, performance tries to uh, incite us to action and change the status quo uh, as uh, we know it. The removal of colonial markers, not only uh, in Canada, but across the world, the removal of markers that are erected to celebrate fascism, that are uh, erected to celebrate totalitarian and violent regimes, is very important uh, in this performance of anti-commemoration, the performance of resistance to oppression. And in that uh, respect, the removal of colonial markers is similar, and especially the toppling of statue, is, is similar to some precedents that we have earlier in history. For example, uh, the toppling of Lenin's uh, statues after the end uh, of the Soviet Union, or the famous toppling of the statue to Saddam Hussein after the end of uh, his regime. And in both of these cases, the toppling of the statue is uh, not merely um, an act, but it is a performance of a stance against a particular oppressive regime and an announcement that the system of values that this regime was built upon has come uh, to an end. So we remember how we watched uh, Lenin's uh, removal of Lenin statues and removal of Saddam statues on TV, and we can recollect uh, how we learn about these acts of removing colonial uh, markers as act of, uh, acts of resistance through social media, where they're repeated and disseminated as events. Now, the act of removing a, uh, the act of removing a colonial marker has this uh, capacity to galvanize people and the capacity uh, to unite them in an act of denouncing a system of values in the regime that they do not uh, believe in. The thing that I find, and again, is a from a position of an ally, not from a position of a disenfranchised person or person who has suffered the history of violence, is that we expect from this removal of colonial markers to produce some kind of a collective catharsis. And especially for the allies to make a statement that uh, this uh, colonial regime has come to the end, that we disapprove of it, and that we're entering some glorious new era in which we will be free of all these values and all this baggage. Um, as um, 
As many First Nations activists have pointed out, um, colonialism has not come to the end. And uh, we have the right and the obligation to remove these colonial markers uh, because they're very painful for some people. But as allies, what we have to ask is whether that pain is going to go completely away if we re remove the marker, um, whether colonialism is gonna end if we proclaim that it's en it has ended, and what we have to have in mind that we do not live in some post-colonial times. We live in colonial times. Um, Residential schools no longer exist. The number of uh, children in foster care is record. We uh, speculate with real estate here in Vancouver and some of these uh, fancy penthouses while First Nation people are still disenfranchised and live in squalor while we uh, bear the fruit of this uh, stolen land. And what I'm trying to uh, say is that maybe we do not need one big catharsis, one big performance, but maybe our duty is to renounce colonialism as long as it exists and to renounce it again and again and again and again until these statues are no longer painful to anyone because we have abandoned collectively a, a particular uh, system of values that these colonial markers stand for. And just so as not to be uh, non-constructive at this moment, I wanted to uh, give an example of what a performance of resistance to totalitarian and colonial values might look like. This is an anti-monument and a performative anti-monument built in Harburg, Ger Germany, which existed in the 80s and uh, in the 90s, where the visitors were invited to write on the lead surface of this statue uh, their condemnation of fascism. And as, they, as people would write, perform their condemnation uh, of fascism, the, uh, the statue, the column, would sink deeper and deeper until uh, as, uh, as many people as possible have performed their denunciation of uh, a, a really, really violent and uh, disgraceful um, moment of, uh, of German history. What I just want to uh, reiterate is that my argument is not that we do not need the removal of colonial markers, but we need something more. We need to renounce colonialism over and over again. And as an ally, I uh, feel that if I'm invited to do so, uh, that would be uh, what uh, I would feel myself obliged uh, to do. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so let's just get right into it. Colonialism ha is a term that has become so normalized that I think it's worth starting this off by refamiliarizing ourselves with what it means. Colonialism is invasion, it is slavery, it is genocide, it is violence, it is sexual abuse, it is physical abuse, it is cultural erasure. Colonialism is white supremacy. What is white supremacy? It is an ideology that upholds racial superiority of white people, therefore the dominance in society of white people to the detriment of racial and ethnic groups. Uh, this map shows the extent of European occupation across the globe. Basically, the parts in orange are the only places that weren't occupied by European settlement. So when we're referring to these colonial markers in the, the removal, removal, we're arguably talking about all the places that you see except for the orange. Uh, this is a more comprehensive map that shows the, uh, the chronology of specific uh, colonial occupation over the centuries, just to give a sense of how often and spread over time imperialism took place. It wasn't just within a specific time, it was a huge amount of time in history. Uh, one of the products of colonialism is the transatlantic slave trade from 1482 to 1888. And this was Europeans traveling to Africa, stealing African people, um, basically toppling them on top of each other in ships uh, and, and uh, traveling them to different parts of the uh, Caribbean and the Americas to work on plantations. And plantations essentially herb, uh, uh, sorry, served as economic hubs uh, for uh, Western civilization. And that was through the exports of things like sugar, tobacco, coffee, cotton, etc free labor. Um, uh, black people were dehumanized. The definition of a slave is literally a commodity. Therefore, there are no human rights. 
Uh, indigenous genocide in Canada began upon first settlement, but the genocide of children attending residential schools uh, continued up to less than 30 years ago. The Canadian government and Canadian churches built the residential school system um, as a means to uphold uh, colonial powers um, as the British was newly forming Canada as a colonial nation. Uh, they perceived indigenous peoples to be a threat and a barrier to their expansion, uh, and as a result, these residential schools became an indoctrination process to erase traditional cultures, and it became a staple of violence as genocide, um, um, as gen genocide and violence in in Canada's history. And we can see this with the uncovering of the um, unmarked graves that we are beginning to find. And on this map, you can see the various locations where residential schools existed in Canada. Now let's go into the functionality. So the functionality of these monuments. Let's remember that there's a fundamental difference between celebrating and recounting history. A monument's functionality is to celebrate and commemorate. Um, this is a picture of a monument in Spanish Town, Jamaica of Admiral Lord Rodney. Um, Spanish Town was the former capital when it was under um, occupation of the Spanish in 1534, um, but the British took over in 1655 until 1872. So the statue of Lord Rodney was built in 1801 and functions as a means of celebrating his ability to sustain British control against France and Spain. Um, so the celebratory function is very much prominent in the matter in which the sculptor designed the piece. So you can see um, that he is in a romanticized Roman hero style um, and the use of the cape and the warrior stance and his hand extended out kind of holding a document proclaiming superiority over the territory. Um, and then you see uh, on the engravings at the bottom in Latin, it's literally proclaiming to the victory. And then there is the romanticizing of slave ships that was used to bring over African bodies. Then there is a beautiful archway that protects this memorial that's very much indicative of high Victorian style of British architecture and the carvings showcase the crest of England there. Uh, so this is still standing in Spanish town where over 90% of the citizens in Jamaica are black African and the infrastructures of this town and Jamaica is very much poor. No architecture looks like this. Um, Emancipation Park in Kingston, Jamaica is a more effective way to, of both recounting history uh, while it's also healing. So firstly, the name Emancipation Park, it implies a focus on liberation as opposed to being conquered. Uh, and the sculpture centered in the middle of the black figures um, uh, is, is evoking liberation through their nakedness and looking towards the sky. Um, it's also important in a contemporary context to realize that these monuments now represent overwhelming symbolic trauma. And this is something that we can't ignore because symbols of trauma shouldn't carry less weight in public spaces than symbols of triumph. Um, so we've seen time and time again the toppling of statues and monuments, and mostly they've been uh, through youth who galvanize these movements, youth activists. Um, we saw this as early as Monday at the Women's Memorial March to honor missing Indigenous women and girls. It was so trauma-filled um, that it brought down the, the toppling of the statue of Gassy Jack. Um, we kn on, on the actual plaque itself, it talks about him being a hero and founding father of Gastown, which is the neighborhood that uh, the statue was situated in, uh, which contrasts with his really predatory legacy of marrying a 12-year-old Squamish bride, Kahalia. Um, also, we want to talk about when it comes to the production of these monuments, um, they are produced when we still are not on a unified consensus on basic historical facts. Therefore, there's a double standard in this installation process, um, and historically, there's, no, there's more governmental support for these colonial markers. Um, uh, Turkey and uh, America are a t a very two good examples of this. So Turkey still to this day does not acknowledge the Armenian genocide, which was the killing of 1.5 million Armenians. Um, and America still is not really recognizing their history of black enslavement uh, and the segregation that continues to this day. Uh, so the image on the left is the Armenian Genocide Memorial that was built in Istanbul, Turkey in 1919. The Turkish government took it down just a few years later. Um, it was the very first monument dedicated to the Armenian Genocide, but nothing, um, the, the Turkish government made sure to take that down right away. And the image on the right is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Alabama. And it was America's very first monument that's our, that is presenting this, um, despite all the years of slavery. Whereas we contrast it with Berlin and they take responsibility and accountability and have a memorial for the Holocaust that's 200,000 square feet. 
Last thing I want to say is that public space, there is an imbalance and unjust control um, of public space, which we have seen through many instances, especially with uh, Barge Chilling Beach recently with how quick we were able to put that sign up, um, yet indigenous groups are asking for proper and traditional naming um, of the beach itself. Um, and that's it. And I'll leave you with this beautiful slide. As we gather on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsiolotu people to discuss the issue of the removal of colonial markers, it is essential to acknowledge that these commemorations cause deep pain and lasting pain. Such is not, should, or nor should never be questioned. It is, however, important to distinguish between what such markers, including place names and street names, sought to do and arguably still do in the context of colonial and national societies. In the context of five centuries of colonial, imperial, and national control violently imposed on the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, and what is achieved actually and seemingly by their toppling, removal, or renaming. At the core of an argument in favor of not removing colonial markers is the conviction that these offending entities can be used productively in the urgent work of combating prejudice, in acknowledging historical injustices, and in advancing human rights and the dignity of all peoples. There are educational opportunities by leaving colonial markers in place for however long necessary to achieve a transformational historical knowledge and recontextualizing them in ways that devalue them and desacralize them. There is no question that the varied colonialist phenomena represent beliefs and prejudicial actions uh, which caused and have co continued to cause profound hurt for many uh, people across centuries, across places, across landscapes, ideologies, and experience. However, it's important to acknowledge that the removal of any type of evidence of the legacy of imperial and colonialism runs the risk of contributing to a type of historical amnesia, not for the victims of colonialism, but for the perpetrators. As the settler Australian anthropologist Patrick Wolfe reminds us, colonialism, colonialism is a structure and not an event. The destructive and oppressive regulatory, epistemological, and cultural legacies of colonialism, imperialism, and statism run incalculably and insidiously deep in Canada. To remove colonial markers does not ensure any change necessarily in dominant settler thinking. And in certain instances, the removal of these commemorations only emboldens the racist and angry sensibilities of the adherents and supporters of white supremacist thinking. Accordingly, the work, the moral, ethical, and reparative obligations of activist decolonization must turn on the investigation by settler Canadians, settlers and colonial agents globally, of their colonial histories, where the confrontation with the past can aid in the willing and determined dismantling of biased and controlling systems of current governance, thinking, and being. The argument in favor of retaining colonial markers, what must be understood as the material culture of colonialism globally, where these objects constitute evidence, turns on a critically rigorous educational program that desacralizes, disempowers these symbols in order for a, re a restorative justice and transformed historical consciousness. Here the argument for the retention of colonial markers turns unequivocally on the idea that the tools of the extant colonialist regime can be effectively used to fight against it. But how? As the embodied and descriptive representations of colonial power institutionalize racism and the history vast and unfolding of cultural genocide against indigenous uh, peoples and others, colonial markers left in situ are both pedagogically valuable and critically revelatory. Again, there is no disputing that they are symbols of pain and commemorate acts that are deplorable, but their absence is a problem. By stripping the markers of their customarily afforded ideological and associational power, they can be neutralized and productively used to investigate the questions of who or what they commemorated and why. Key in the investigation of history is to understand the past on its own terms. What were the circumstances by colonial agents that caused uh, such pain through genocidal action, through policies, uh, and uh, through a committed act of modernization and cultural disintegration and violence. Answers to these fittingly historical questions can illuminate the structures, can illuminate the structures and thoughts that define the colonial era and colonialism. 
Colonial markers left in place invite, indeed demand, attention and investigation. Each marker can function as a portal to the past. Viewed as evidentiary tools in the collectively organized work of historical research, analysis and discussion, and knowledge production and exchange, the focused consideration of the circumstances of the establishment of colonial regimes and the markers to mark that quote unquote progress in a Eurocentric mindset will foster overdue critique and perhaps beneficially challenge and undo the dominant narratives of white supremacist Canada and its jurisdictions. These physical and taxonomic objects in the public realm can be uh, analyzed with remarkable, can be served, excuse me, can serve as remarkable and effective catalysts in advancing an objective anti-hegemonic historical consciousness, whether facilitated by new plaques, material augmentations, demonstrative protests, I haven't got my glasses, two minutes, thank you. <laughs> Although the arguments in favor of expunging colonial markers uh, rest on the idea that there is benefit in, in achieving uh, such a historical examination collectively, I would argue that their removal irreparably obliterates significant evidence of colonial thought. If we considered a city as an archive, that the built environment established over centuries by settlers, then all the objects that define where we live are pieces of invaluable evidence about the processes of history. Although a colonial marker is an obnoxious piece of remembrance, it was created in the context of time. Material culture as a discipline tells us that we should investigate all human-made objects because of what these objects can tell us about the people who made them, who used them, and the consequences across time and place. There could be no doubt that a frank, uncensored, and unstinting shared knowledge of the past is vital for collective well-being, and beneficial changes can come through an unstinting scrutiny of the past, however difficult. Removing colonial markers may be a salve for the victims of colonialism, but it's convenience, perhaps, and an agitation for settlers. I would argue that colonial markers need to be retained not because of uh, the need to in maintain uh, the systems of colonialism, but quite the contrary. As a settler person, I am painfully aware about my own complicity in the genocidal colonialism that persists in the nation state, constructed as it is of Canada. I would argue that we as settlers have an obligation to examine all evidence of our shared history in the service of humanity and in the service of what might be and can be a transformative future. The historian, thank you. <laughs> So let's have an exchange. Who'd like to begin? <laughs> I guess I would start with every time that someone describes themselves as an ally, I ask them, who told you that? Who told you that you're an ally? I think that a lot of the other side's arguments are fundamentally continuing to uh, center the settler. The experience of removing it may be, may be cathartic for settlers. It may be. Uh, it may uh, spark debate. I certainly have been part of that debate because I've gotten a lot of emails after uh, supporting removing a statue. But it's not about centering settlers. There's a lot of places for settlers to continue to do work to dismantle colonialism. Like there's, statues are but one place. We have tons of laws and policies that are still upholding colonialism. Let's work on those as well. We don't have to continue to remove uh, statues over and over and over again to do that work, to pretend to do that work. That word is performativity. It's not real work on it. And I guess when we talk about it being a place of interrogation, I assure you that they are not a place of interrogation. Uh, no settler uh, was aware of the Begbie statue until we decided to remove it. But urban indigenous people and the Sulkoti nation told us that they were harmed by it. Are we to tell them, tough luck, settlers need to learn? That is continu to continue to, set to center the people who have set up these systems of harm. And we need to stop doing that. We need to, to move it towards centering the voices of those who are harmed by this. Thank you. If it's not a performative act, what is it? Why wouldn't you remove the statue quietly without any public event that would commemorate it? You're arguing that it's not a performance uh, it, it, that it's deeply meaningful. By saying that it's a performance, I'm not challenging that it's deeply meaningful, but I'm saying that it has this theatrical event 
that is the uh, dementia, which is a very, very important component. Why not just remove it? Petition the, um, the, the, the petition the civic authority saying we are going to remove it quietly and the dialogue removed. What, when I say performing, what does this public, loud, televised, social media lines performance of it mean for us uh, as witnesses, as people who are directly, um, who are direct, directly affected by it? If it's not performance, like why do it publicly? Why do you just want to remove it in class? Crystal. <laughs> okay, so I just want to start by using um gassy jack as an example so um we saw a lot of uh during the march we saw a lot of indigenous trauma and the toppling of gassy jack i want to start by saying the media and and everyone else who wasn't in the march getting involved that was actually a byproduct of it happening the indigenous people didn't call CTV in advance or or people on Instagram and say, get ready and, and film this. We're going to be toppling it at, at this time. That's a byproduct of it happening. It's, it's news, it's media, the reporting on it. But I also want to say that there were quiet behind closed doors plans to remove Gassy Jack between the city and the Squamish nation. And that didn't get to happen because of, of, of the trauma, though. Trauma is not theatric. Trauma. This is what you're seeing. The act. These acts that look that look so grand and are happening publicly because these monuments are in public spaces. But that is the weight of the trauma. That is the weight of the hurt. And it's they're not doing it to get attention or for performance. They're doing it because they literally are the descendants of a bloodline that has been conquered. That is has experienced violence, genocide. This is what pain looks like. This is what it feels like. Um, and, and so I would argue that the social media and media attention is a byproduct of it happening. I wonder where the, um, the representatives of the Squamish nation have plans to remove it quietly and there's something else happening there wishes. Yes, there, there were ceremonies in place. And, and, and so that's the point. There, because it is about them and it is about uh, the descendants um, of his child's Squamish bride. It is. It is all. That's what it's about. It's not about making a spectacle. So those were the plans. Nobody knew about the plans because they were done quietly. So I would argue against you saying that all the topplings are not always this theatrical spectacle. Most of the times there are plans behind closed doors. But again, this is what pain looks like. This is what trauma looks like. Thank you. There's no question that settler society, there's no question that settler society in Canada operates under a profound ignorance of the history of the systems by which they benefit. The question I would have for our, our worthy opponents in this debate would be what me, by what means would you suggest a transformation of historical consciousness? When I walk past colonial markers, I'm disgusted. I'm a historian, so I'm aware about the means by which Europeans came to Turtle Island colonized people, oppressed people, transformed the landscape, exploited, murdered, any number of things. But I'm equally concerned when I talk to my students that that awareness of history uh, is naive, glossed, romanticized. Canada, the great populous, multicultural, democratic state, built on the backs of genocide. If a statue could in some way stimulate conversation, could stimulate an interrogation of the past, mindful of the pain of these representational objects, then why not? Because as a historian, I believe that every object is evidence and every piece of evidence needs to be safeguarded and used in the critique, the profound, determined, and transformative critique of the violent past. And if a marker can do that, then let us use those for transformation, not remove them where we can have amnesia and oblivion. Um, OK, so the first part. Um of you so yes i'm i'm also a historian and so to a degree i i do agree that preserving objects and and them being evidence of history is true however my challenge to you is that we do not need to um keep them as evidence and continue to study them in public spaces 
take it down, take it into the basement of where, where all the other art galleries and museums keep their collections, where conservation takes place, where they study it. It doesn't need to happen in public space where people walk by symbols of trauma. We can still preserve these objects in ways, um, like you said, to study them, uh, but it doesn't need to be in public space. Uh, secondly, I think I presented a pretty effective alternative with Emancipation Park in Kingston, Jamaica, where um, we are, we're still talking about that colonial history, but it's not through the lens of white supremacy. It is through the lens of these people being liberated. It is, th it is, it is a sculpture and a monument of the people who um, are a reflection of the people who are living there. So we, we, we talk about the emancipation, but people will say emancipation from what? And that is when we go into the history and the studyings of everything. So um, yeah, if you want to say. I guess if, if that were the case that preserving these statues would educate the public, then we've had the statues. Why are we not educated? They've been up since the 70s and 80s. Everyone should know it. By a show of hands, how many people here knew the history of John Robson, the square that we're in right now? Oh, okay. So, like, five. So, but this is John <laughs> Robson Square that we're in right now. We should probably maintain that name so we should all know it. If that were the case, we would already know it. We can know it through storytelling, through music, through performance, through art, centering the voices of the people who are harmed. So centering Indigenous people, uh, QT BIPOC people, um, who can actually tell those stories from their voice, not from the voice of the colonizer. That's out there. It's What it does is it actually invisibilizes that history and normalizes that history. It does not reveal it. It hides it in plain sight, is what it does. If I may, sorry. <laughs> there, there's a powerful argument that colonial ideologies colonize colonizers because individuals living benefit of settler culture, settler economics, white supremacist power, become inured to the systems that define them, uncritical of the means by which they exist. If a statue or a conversation about John Robson might occasion some sort of self-reflection, some scrutiny of privilege, then so be it. Colonial markers, as I understand it, go far beyond statues in public parks. Mm -hmm. I drove to UBC. Uh, yesterday, and one can go up West Point Gray, and every street name is either Scots or some sort of historical European marker on indigenous unceded lands. Let's change all the names. We should. But to do so without an explanation about how these places were named in the first place may avoid problematically an opportunity to actually teach people about their privilege of which they are ignorant. I don't absolutely. Probably in more ways than. Yes, for sure, Michael. But I think we need to remember as historians that there are various forms of primary sources and secondary sources that can be consulted to educate ourselves on history. It doesn't need to always be through colonial monuments in public spaces. There are so many forms. We can actually study letters that were written um, from, from certain colonizing figures. We can listen to uh, different um, storytelling from different indigenous groups. There are so many different forms of primary sources, which you know as a historian, why do we need to place so much emphasis on these statues? When, when I'm learning about um, certain events in history, I consult through these different primary sources and things like monuments are just kind of a side effect to to the argument in and of itself. It kind of just reinforces what happened, but that's not how I learn about it. That's not how it's contextualized. It's almost like a byproduct. But again, I want to emphasize, even if we are arguing that these are historical objects and that these are evidence, we do not need to be learning about them or even um, uh, holding them or studying them as evidence in public spaces that cause trauma. We don't need that. We, I think, agree with you both, um, Michael and I. I. I think we are, to a large extent, here in agreement that statues do not sell, that their statues are not value neutral. That they celebrate particular people and particular sets of values rather than merely marking them or commemorating. I think what Michael and I are trying to get across is that maybe tearing down the statues and erasing the, all the remnants of history is counterproductive because we are left with uh, a blank slate, and which might be a statement that we are done with all these um, 
values and all these colonial principles and everything that these statues uh, represented. And our proposal, I think, that we have been talking about is not uh, that it, in order to just kind of counter this great danger, this is, this is a danger of like obliterating any trace and then what are we talking about? is to maybe a, um, adopt an additive approach. You wouldn't tear the statue down and then nothing exists, but you would add uh, anti-monuments, performative objects, until this statue is completely crowded by alternative voices. So we do not only have to be a, have a subtractive process of reacting to colonial markers, we have the alternatives of creating additive processes. And we should seriously think about that as an alternative of activism. I, I guess I would say that removing them is not erasing them. It's not erasing history. That is not true. There, because you're also saying that there will be news coverage and all these things of the removal. There will be, and there's a record of that statue existing. We could have it in a museum and archives, as it is in New Westminster as well. It's no longer in a place of power that harms indigenous people, but it still exists. It's not erased. Like this idea that we're obliterating it from the record is simply not true. Nobody showed any interest in Bagby and that history until we removed that statue in the first place. Also, when we say that we want to maintain it and and uh, you know crowd out the voices, at the expense of who? When people say that they are harmed by the presence of a monument, my position is that we should listen to that. If 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 the Sokoti Nation had said we should crowd that crowd that out with other people, I would have said okay, let's do that. That's up to you to decide what the remedy to harm is. Same as the example I gave about my grandmother. When we say, actually, we know better than you, we know what will remedy this, that is fundamentally reenactment of colonialism because it's settler voices deciding what is the remedy for the harm that they have caused upon people who disagree with them. So at the end of the day, it needs to be, there could be different interventions on different statues, on different place names, but it's up for the people who are harmed to decide and if people could show one-tenth of the care for the erased indigenous history on this land and for you know, other BIPOC histories on this land, then maybe I would give any credence to that argument. But when I was accused of erasing history because I removed a statue, nobody brought up the millennia of erased history that settlers are responsible for. So let's focus on that, that concern instead, and, and making that, that history visible first. Thank you. And if I can say now, is there some questions from the audience? Should we interject a few questions? Uh, on Monday, I flattened the gas of Jack's head and ripped off his arm. It was in recognition of total institution, dehumanizing effects in tourism, and the disconnect of host and urban indigenous youth with the colonial institutions, i.e. the city of Vancouver and the chief of council. The arm ripoff represented the lack of consent given to indigenous people. I'm often called like a land defender, a warrior, a Egyptow, a two-spirit shapeshifter. And on Tuesday, I found myself being a leftist, communist fed. Uh, I wanted to know what solutions should I maybe take next time when I'm taking down these things so that I'm seen. Because I think that's maybe some part of the problem is that as much as you, you talked about those things of, of seeing them on the news media, there's still the erasure of even the people that went up there and did this happen. So I come here today completely proud of finding what I've done. Um, perhaps I'd like to maybe talk to the Squamish Nation because I understand that uh, as much as there is that disconnect, those are their voices as well, regardless of where they are. Oh, but I want to know, yeah, what can I do to stop being a leftist communist bag as an indigenous? I mean, I guess it. I guess I just want to acknowledge you and your strength in being here, and that we again we are talking about you and your experiences, and I think this is our work is to uplift your voices, your name, the names of the women who did pull down that statue. That they're not just indigenous women; they are from certain nations. They are they have names and histories as well. So I think that is on us to to not to continue to not continue to make you invisible. So I think that is our work, and thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, OK, so the next question is to Michael. In keeping the statue, if keeping the statue has benefit, perhaps the answer is recontextualization. If, de if destruction is to move whiteness from fear to anger, then to exercising of their fear, 
then perhaps leaving the broken shards has more value than leaving them as they are or completely remove, or additions to the site that allow for a visual dialogue. It's a great point, great question. You follow, you follow the news uh, with the uh, toppling of everything Ryerson in Toronto. Uh, he was, the statue was pissed on, painted, uh, but fouled in any number of ways. The university very quickly removed it, cleaned it up, re-landscaped the site where it stood. And for a visitor going to campus, you would think of, I, I, what I don't see, I don't know. That type of erasure is highly problematic. I, as a settler, would like the foul statue to stay in place. I would like activist interventions on those sites, talking about history, talking about pain, talking about suffering. As a historian, I, I can't, I can't turn my back on the most unsettling and horrible evidence. In fact, that's the very evidence that one needs to focus upon. If I went to an archive and the archivist said, oh, we destroyed all of that because it was so painful, it means that we'll actually never know the circumstances of thought and action at the time. So the, the question is very good, and I would be fine with any type of interventions and actions on collecting markers. Thank you, Michael. And we'll have a retort by Crystal. Michael, my ancestors' history was erased the moment they were stacked on ships from Africa and taken to the Americas. I can't even trace back what my African side, what that traditional, what it is. Because again, they literally stole the bodies and stacked them in ships and brought them over. I can't even trace my Indian side. My last name, Parabu, the Hindu version is Prabhu, and it was anglicized by the British when they came over as indentured laborers. My history was erased without any kind of consultation of, of my ancestors. So why is it when it comes to white colonialism, there's all, all of a sudden this argument about erasure and, and this controversy around erasure when they had no problem erasing practically the entire globe's history for the sake of, of, of economic prosperity. That's my argument to that. Thank you, Crystal. We have another, oh, we have about 30 seconds left, so I think that's all we'll have for questions, but thanks for the questions that did come in. And so now we're going to have the closing arguments. Each debater will have only two minutes, and there'll be a strict two minutes. Uh, to do it to, to sum things up, a summation, and then you, audience, you will and I will get to vote again. So let's start with Nadine. Two minutes ago. <laughs> we can't address the, the harms of colonialism by reenacting it. And at the end of the day, um, having spectacle uh, and centering the voices of settlers just continues, just continues the, the, the project of colonialism. If we actually want to address the harm, we have to listen to those who are negatively impacted. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. It matters how we go about doing this work. Colonialism is the, the ocean that we're swimming in right now. And there's lots of places to continue to do that. I just want to uplift the Murder to Missing Indigenous Women report, the TRC calls to action, and of course, UNDRIP. And if you're not familiar with those, please go familiarize yourself and center those who are impacted by harms. Thank you. And next we'll have Tiana. Well, I've, seen, I've heard two very powerful arguments from you that um, also uh, made me uh, reconsider my position and uh, seriously reflect on this. The first argument uh, was of something that we already discussed, is that colonial markers are not value neutral. And I think a lot of discussion has centered on that. And the second argument, which I think also is very powerful, is that erasure begets erasure. And the erasure of the remnants of colonial history is a just retribution for the erasure of histories of the majority of uh, humans. My, I have a little bit of a problem with the first uh, part, where you argue that if we are going to consider our history in a meaningful and thorough manner, we need to remove these statues and move them to our one of the dangers is that they're going to be even more invisible, and that even fewer and fewer people are going to be interested in them, like looking at statues hidden somewhere in the um, basements of the BC Museum. The second thing is uh, that I absolutely agree with you that erasure should be erasure. 
how if uh, how would this um, retribution would you start if you are speaking in the name of uh, the people who have uh, experienced violence and dispossession historically? How would you start um, a common debate, a process in in this society in which we hear the voices uh, of the disenfranchised and which we can respond to? This, uh, the tearing down the monument is a singular event. That's what I just meant as a performance. How do we continue this dialogue? Maybe retaining partially uh, soiled and mutilated colonial markers, depriving them of their value, is a way to just continue this uh, discussion. I agree that you have very powerful. Thank you, your words. time's up. How do we get <laughs> And so next we'll move to Krista talking about a colonial process, right? Because yes. in indigenous culture, sometimes you'll talk for days. <laughs> so, Crystal. Um, okay, so I just want to kind of reiterate that um, colonial markers, while they do also function as a mechanism of historical object, um, uh, I feel like most of them, most of historical objects and their conservation and, and kind of the studying of them is always from um, the perspective of whiteness or, or white-centric um, methods of conserving um, these. So if, if we want to talk about um, kind of making it a bit more equitable in terms of conservation as historical objects, uh, let's think about that. And, and one way to think about that is taking them out of public spaces. Um, I also want to um, remind everyone that there is an unnecessary weight that's placed on these monuments as tools for education. As Nadine pointed out, um, they haven't been accurate or common forms of us learning about anything. Um, and I also just want to point out that there's actually a lot of um, historical and conservation societies that are actually working towards this progression. Uh, the Society of Architectural Historians um, uh, uh, who support heritage conservation, um, they're a committee, they're actually, they've actually released a statement saying that they haven't um, removed or uh, uh, any colonial monument in over 80 years and for the first time they're finally doing that because they recognize that the trauma that these monuments hold um, does not outweigh um, these colonial structures. Um, so that is uh, something that I just wanted to emphasize. And then to T uh, Tiana, I think one of your um, earlier arguments, you had mentioned something about um, 15 seconds. The renouncing colonialism is, is the way to do it, but I feel like removing these markers does renounce colonialism. Thank you for that, Crystal. And now, Michael. I think we have to be reminded of Karl Marx and Capital, who said, colonialism and imperialism are linked to capitalism, and capitalism is the domain of power, particularly white power and white supremacy at the expense of many, many peoples. The question I would have is, by what means can settlers find the efficacy to confront their own complicity in the genocide of colonialism globally? If a marker in a public sphere could stimulate people to take the steps to think about their own privilege and their own status and their own perpetuation of systems of oppressive power, then perhaps that statute, for whatever duration, is necessary. As a historian, I know that public school curriculum, university curriculum, not interested in the interrogation of white supremacist colonial history. There's a gloss on nationalism, and as a result, we settlers have an obligation, individually and collectively, to confront our own engagement and complicity in the violent systems of history. OK. So thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for your summations. So now we've come to the moment when you, by voting, will determine the winning team. The results are in, and okay, may I have your attention please, the results are in. Our second vote is pro 86 and con 14. So, the pro have an increase of 5%, is it still on my reading? And, and the cons have a decrease of 5%. So the pros are the winners. <laughs> Monument.
A mini monument. Thank you for our colonial markers. <laughs> so now, Amy, remind me. Thank you, being great opponents. For about two years now, we have been doing small group discussions on various topics where participants not just discuss a topic, but are exposed to different ideas and apply those ideas to that topic. We actually, those first talks, we actually did a set on monuments two years ago. Um, and we looked at, you know, who has voice, the stability of meaning, and, and looking at a number of ways contested monuments have been approached. Um, and that was held in the spirit of providing a space to open ourselves to different ways of thinking and through listening, honest conversation and interaction, make for a healthier public life. So Amy uh, and I are working on adapting those sessions to what's come out of this debate and recent local events so that we can offer companion programming and give people an opportunity to participate in discussions on this topic separate from the debate. Uh, we'll be announcing those dates and the content soon, and we hope a lot of you can join us if you're interested.